Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward, and I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James Grounded Family Bible Study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly, I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Philemon verses 18 and 19 if he hath wronged thee he would be Onassis thee would be Philemon or owes thee aught put that on my account Paul speaking I Paul have written it with my own hand I will repay it albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thy own Self besides. Strong words in a one chapter book, probably ignored by many Christians. And the subject that we see today is in a very important subject. It's called imputation. And according to the Webster's 1828 dictionary, the act of imputing or charging, generally in all ill sense, as the imputation of crimes of faults to the true authors of them. We are liable to the imputation or numerous sins and errors, imagine that in a, in a dictionary, to the imputation of pride, vanity, and self-confidence. Imagine that in a dictionary. Couldn't put this dictionary in the schools today. To the imputation of weakness or rashness. It comes down to imputation as the subject is I myself as the Bible relates to me I'm a sinner I stand guilty of my sins and my crimes against God and against mankind now to impute and the Latin and all that number one Number one of the dictionary, 1828 Webster's. To charge, to set to the account of, generally ill, sometimes good. We impute crimes, sins, trespasses, faults, blames, etc. to the guilty persons. We impute wrong actions to bad motives, or in ignorance, or to folly and rashness. We impute misfortunes and miscarriages to imprudence. Crime imputed to the criminal. So when person stands before the judge and the trial is over, both the plaintiff has, has brought his deal, the defendant has brought his deal, we're not in a jury trial here. We're before a judge. And the crime has been spoken to the judge. The defense and the claims have been brought to that judge. Now the judge makes the sentence. And with a guilty sentence, that judge says, you are guilty of that crime. I am going to impute that crime upon you, and which the fine would be money, imprisonment, or even death. But you, the criminal, you're in charge of what you've done, and there are actions that need to be followed. Whatever the charges are by a court or the fees, monetary, erase them. Onassimus, and put them upon Paul. Wow, amen. 
Paul has told Onas, uh, Philemon about Onassis. Send this letter to Philemon. Whatever. And we don't know how harsh it is. People have speculated and assumed. Whatever Onassis has done to you, put that on my account. Put it to my charges. If he's stolen from you, remove that theft charge upon Onassis and make me, Paul, the thief. That's a very bold statement. I heard a judge one, uh, a judge one time say, uh, as far as someone taking your crime is not permitted in America. I don't know. I don't know the law on that. According to the Bible. Because let me look at the situation here. Barabbas, you are guilty of murder, insurrection, and other deeds of the law. You're going to be crucified. You're guilty. You have been imputed to the crimes against the state. Now let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, did Barabbas go to that cross and suffer and die for his crimes? Absolutely not. Someone else suffered and died for the crimes. And that person had to be sinless, with no crimes of his own, with no charges of his own. Barabbas went home, and Jesus went to the cross and died. Now, account the fact is, we don't know anything about Barabbas after that. Had he, if he ever believed on Jesus Christ as his Savior, all those charges and all his sins would have been laid upon Jesus Christ. And not just that afternoon. We're going to go in deep. Jesus Christ told God, the Father, because of Calvary, take all the sins of Stiley Hayward and put them upon me. All the sins that my mother never knew I did, and she knew plenty about me. All the sins that my father and he knew some about me. My wife, my children, my neighbors. There are sins that people don't even know about me. Jesus knows about me. And God definitely knows about me. And Jesus says, you take that sin. I'm the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Take that sin away from style. And put it upon me. And that's what happened that afternoon when Jesus died and suffered in that cross. That was what Jesus in the garden. Father. If it's possible. Let this cup pass from me. Not the death. But the sin. And Jesus. Through his merit. Through his gospel. Nothing I've done myself. Imputation to God. Say hey. Father. He's a sinner. He has admitted he's a sinner. Lay those sins on me. And we run back to Calvary. And take my holiness. And my righteousness. And put them upon him. A, w, a double imputation. Of my sins going upon Jesus Christ. And his righteousness and his holiness coming upon me. And Paul is telling finally, hey, everything he's done wrong, you just put it on me. Paul has become a type of Jesus Christ. Onassimus has become a type of sinner. Philemon has become a type of the father. And Paul is telling Philemon, don't you dare look at anything Onassimus has done for you. It's on me. And if you have never had that happen in your life that God has died for you, Acts 20, 28, shed his blood for you. And the fact is that if any shall confess their sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to wash us of all uncleanness through Jesus Christ. That is salvation. That is something that beads, water, baptism, church attendance cannot do. So again, Paul becomes a type of Jesus Christ. Philemon becomes a type of God. And I, for this story, was a runaway slave, Onassimus. 
I ran from the church that my family grew. Listen, I had access to a Bible. Four years away from God, no assembly or anything like that in any church. I could have got myself a Bible. I wasn't looking for God. If I was looking for God, I would have grabbed the Bible. I would have read the Bible. I would have gone to God, but I wasn't looking. God was looking for me. At the age of 18, he called out. God is remarkable what he's done for us. It's remarkable. The fact is, God has given me a voice. God has given me the learning. God has given me the ability to go out and preach the gospel. Go out and talk to people about the, about the Bible. Teach them what they don't know. And there are people there who hate what I do. And yet they are rejecting not me. They are rejecting what God and Jesus Christ, which is far beyond our comprehension of what he has done for us. The fact is that all my sins have been laid on Jesus. And for that fact is I have access to the Father and my righteousness is not my own because I'm a sinner. You cannot have sinner and righteousness together. You've got to have the sin removed to be righteous and even that... I'm no good. But Jesus Christ steps in. And when God sees me, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus. Paul is telling Philemon to receive him on my merit. It's me, Philemon, Paul. And I'm not going to heaven by works. But on the merit of Jesus Christ alone. Merit means earned, deserved. And there are people out there who think, well, I deserve to be in heaven. No, you don't. You have sinned against the Father since you have been conceived and since you have been born. You have sinned against God. You are born into sin. You are born into Adam's race. The first Adam. You don't deserve no part in heaven. You don't deserve anything of the Father but by what Jesus Christ has done through the gospel, through the merit of Jesus Christ. I got to go to heaven. It is earned, it is deserved only by my Savior. He earned what I couldn't earn. I couldn't do it. No man can do it. We needed help from God. A lost man who is not saved needs help from God. Those that I'm talking to myself are saved. We've already got that needed help from Jesus Christ. And there's no boasting of what we can do. When we talk about serving God and doing works... We're supposed to do it. God said do it. So when we see this book less taught, not read, we miss the greatest thing that Jesus Christ has ever done. Now what happened on Jesus Christ? On that night he was arrested to the cross and death. God beat him. Isaiah 53 tortured him beyond any pain that any man has ever suffered. No man has ever suffered like Jesus Christ. 100% God, 100% man. You know what happens in hell? You are tor tormented to the point that you have been no ever tormented like anybody has ever been tormented because there is no relief. There is no help. God did not help Jesus Christ on that cross. He could have. He could have sent legions and legions of angels and wiped out this entire earth. But God stood back. And when that sin became Jesus Christ, God turned out all the lights and turned away. And Jesus, I don't care what you think, Jesus Christ went into hell, suffered in hell, deposited our sins in hell. That's supposed to be us, the sinners. And yet we will not see hell by the merit and the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has already, already paid that price to the Father for us. 
Now, do you realize when you say Mary, beads, idolatry, church, well, my church, we get to heaven, my baptism, do you realize what you're saying? You are saying that material goods on this planet earth of sin is more important and better than what Jesus Christ finished work that's approved of the Father. And you're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment and say, God, Jesus. And the Bible said, didn't I do works in your name? Didn't I do this, Jesus? Didn't I? The Bible proclaims they are going to profess to Jesus that they, what they did was more important than Jesus. And Jesus' reaction and words will be, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. See, that salvation did not work. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. How does God know you through Jesus Christ? It's plain and simple. Onassimus earned, deserved the break, and not by his own account. You know, Onassimus, as far as his story, you know what he deserved? He deserved to go back to Philemon, get beat, get sold on the market. Whatever Philemon had that he could do to Onassimus would have been proper. Onassimus is the wrong, not Philemon. Now, I don't care how you feel about the slave market or anything like that. Onassimus was owned by Philemon, wrong or right. Onassimus had done wrong. And we got to get off, oh, we hate slavery because you know what? Before God, before Jesus Christ, we were sold to sin. We were sold to Satan. You know what he was going to do to us? He's going to cast us off into hell with him to burn for all eternity. Well, you don't think you have that right, whatever you think you do and all that. A man that's not saved is going to hell with Satan and burn and torment forever. You deserve that. Because you have not believed on the only begotten name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He that has the Son has everlasting life. He that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abiding upon him. But God... So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then by, uh, Paul steps in and says, listen, put that all on my account. So when you see Onassimus Philemon, all you see is somebody who has never done you wrong. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived 33 and a half years and lived throughout eternity before, eternity uh, past, and never, ever done God wrong. That's Jesus. Righteousness to holiness. I don't have that. But I got the holiness and righteousness of Jesus. And the scripture was fill, fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. What happened with Abraham? He believed God. God, I know you're going to do it. Okay, fine. What happened to Abraham? I give you my righteousness because you believed. What did, what, what did God do with me? Do you believe Jesus Christ suffered and died for you and is taking the, pen, the penalty and the pain and suffering of hell for you? Lord, I believe that. I don't want to go to hell. I believe on Jesus. You believe that. Yes, I believe that. Have you ever seen it? No, I've never seen it. Hebrews 11, 1. That's faith. I impute to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith just as much as he's done it to Abraham. Abraham and I had the same thing. Faith in God going to do what you think is impossible to do. It's all fulfilled by Jesus. It was given to Abraham. Why? Because he believed God. What are lost people out there saying with their, their works? There's not of God. I believe this statue can do it. And that statue is going to cast you off into hell. My church, look at my church. Look how great our church is. Look how great our pastor is. And if it's not Jesus Christ, it's going to cast you off into hell. That's where the natural man goes. Hell. The unnatural man believes on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God told Abraham and Abraham believed. God tells the church, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that? You got to answer yes or no. Yes, get you get your sins imputed to Jesus Christ and you get the imputation of Jesus' righteousness on you. Reject that and 
Just go on your merry way to hell. Remain your father, the devil, the Satan, as your father. John 8, 44. God charged Abraham with righteousness by his faith in what God said. What God said. The word of God. You read Romans 10? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, I got saved off a movie. Yeah, that ain't, that ain't good enough. You got to have a Bible. You got to have somebody open a Bible. Romans chapter 10, a preacher comes to you with the word of God and preaches to you the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died according to scriptures, was buried, and arose again the third day according to the scriptures. He buried before warned because there's another Jesus, there's another gospel, and there's another spirit out there. You better get the right one. You better be in the Bible. So we're talking about the word of God. What's the word of God? It got us in trouble in the beginning. God told Adam, do not eat of that fruit. Don't. What did Adam and Eve do? They ate the fruit. Then they came into trouble. Rebelling against what God has said can get you in big trouble. If God says not to do it and you do it, you're in trouble. If God says do it and you don't do it, you're in trouble. That's what sin comes down. What did God say? And what are you doing? So what could you say to the writers of the NIV, ASV, New King James, Good News, etc., etc., etc.? There's only one word of God. Put your faith in the old Jeremiah 6.16, King James 16.11, AV, Authorized Bible. That is the only word of God. One Father, one Spirit, one Savior, one Jesus Christ. 400,000 Bibles. I don't think so. That's not God's way. Absolutely not. 2 Corinthians 5, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, Jesus. Christ became a sinner for me, my sins. I, it's not possible. But September 6, 1968, the day I was born. I don't know I'm going to die. I don't. And if you were to get a sheet of paper, many sheets of paper, a ton of paper, probably not enough paper ever been made, and you write down my sins and when I did them, how I did it, why I did it, where I did it, who, what, where, and why of, of a sin. Now let's take one sin. When I did it, how often I did it, where I did it, why I did it, what I did it. How I, no, I can't remember if I, what I said, but you take all those sins in my life, all of them. I don't even know. And you're going to stand before God one day. Well, God, see, you know, I went to church and I ate this wafer and I feed five full foam and all that. And what's that going to do with your sins? It only added more sins. It added idolatry to the list. A refusal for Jesus for Mary. That's when I grew up. And one day, I'm sitting there with an open Bible with Joe Whitmore and Joe Caswell. They are showing me the Word of God. They are laying out the Word of God. They are telling me that Jesus suffered and died for me. And if I don't get right with God and I don't believe on Jesus Christ as my Savior, I will go to hell. I sat there Saturday afternoon and said, I don't want to go to hell. I hate pain. No, I don't want to go. You've got to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. I got down on my knees, my grandma's coffee table, and I asked God to save my soul. 
And that point from the day I was born to that Saturday afternoon, April 21st, 1987, God took those sins and erased them with the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, those sins that you've done so far are on Jesus. Jesus paid all those sins. They're done. They're canceled. You don't owe them no more. And I got the receipt and I looked at the receipt and said, paid in full in blood. That's that was great. Amen. I'm washed and what do I get now? How dare I ask what I get now? But you know what I got? I got Christ's righteousness. I got Christ's holiness. I've got a mansion. I got a city I'm going to. I'm going to glory. I'm getting a, a new body. I'm getting no pain, no sorrow, no suffering. I'm not going to hell. Because Jesus Christ erase those sins and when God looks at me now he sees his son there was, there was this sims game you play and your, your little thing walk little diamond thing walking around their head that's almost like what God sees us when God looks down from heaven he sees mankind he sees only two men ones that are in their own sins and ones that are in Jesus that's it if you're not in Jesus, you don't have the imputation of Jesus Christ. You're not saved. You will go to hell. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Saved from what? Hell. That's a bad word of churches today. That's the very means of imputation. And as a child of God today, if I sin to God, I look filthy. And I plead and I confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. How? By the imputation of Jesus Christ. The, the, the bloody work that Jesus done on this earth with his body being ripped open. His body being thorned. His body being whipped. Being nailed. That blood, Acts 20, 28, which is God's blood, cleanses me from all sin. It's nothing I can do. I just sit back and I get the benefit of Jesus Christ in my life for nothing I ever done and for the abused treatment he got. That's unfair. It's unfair to Jesus. Look what he got. I'm so bad, he's got to give me a new body. He's got to give me a new everything because I'm still a sinner in this flesh. Paul was never a runaway slave. Nor a thief to finally, and some people say Onassis was a thief. But he would take in that charge in order to give Onassis a break. You know what Paul did? He loved Onassis. That's love. And where do you run that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? He gave his son. What did he do to his son? Abused and mistreated him with blood that he should do to the sinner. A man goes into hell today not because he's a sinner, because he has rejected the love gift. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You anger God enough to cast off into the lake of fire because you have not believed what Jesus has done for you. And you're a fool to trust in anything but God. You're a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So Jesus Christ never lied. Never gave up. And all the rest of my sins, and I'm not going to tell you, I've lied. I've given up. But Jesus Christ took my sins and placed them upon himself, of which in the garden he prayed three times. It was God's will that my sins be put upon Jesus Christ, suffering for sin. That was the will of God. And we put sin on, on you know, a, a, a weight. And there are vile sins out there, but all sin. There are different degrees in hell, according to the Bible. 
And think about whether you've done it or somebody else has done it. Just think about it for a moment. In your aspect, in your pea brain that God gave you, at this moment right now, think of the most vilest, wickedest sin that you can think of, whether you did it or not. Anybody can do the most vilest and wicked sin that can ever be done by a human. And if we confess our sins, that most vile, wicked sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You know, Jesus was in that garden. He looked in that cup. He saw those sins. He saw the actions of those sins. He saw the results of those sins. He saw the pleasures of those sins. Hebrews chapter 11. He said, no! I'm too holy! But we are not. Son, there's no other way to save that creation. But Father, you know how wicked this is. There's no other way. You can walk away and we'll just cast them all into hell. But I love them. See, the unsaved man, television, radio, they just throw love out. They don't realize what true love is. And the true love is the third time when Jesus got up off the ground. And he, he walks over to the side. Well, you guys are sleeping. I'm over here in agony, dripping blood. I'm talking to the Father and you guys are sleeping. Thank you very much. Who's that coming? Judas. Mwah. Well, thank you. And he went to that cross and suffered and died for our sins. All the times we take Jesus Christ's name in vain, if we were to put them in the blood of Jesus, I don't see it no more. It was God's will that my sins be put on Jesus' suffering, on his offering, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Sin is, is singular. All sin. There is no degree of sin when it comes to you coming to Jesus and saying, I put my sin upon you. All of it. I've had people come to me personally and say, I am just too wicked for Jesus to save me. No. Stop putting a degree on sin that Jesus never put on. Behold the Lamb of God which take away the sin that most vilest, wicked sin ever and the most cleanliest of sin at all. No, I didn't take the cookie. A lie. A lie is a lie. Woe be to the man who has not, or let me say, in the change of mind, woe be to the man that his sins be not imputed to Jesus Christ. You must have your sins imputed to Jesus Christ to be saved. If you don't, you will stand at judgment of your sins, which you cannot ever do to pay. And you'll be cast off in a lake of fire that burns forever. Because, again, like I said, I grew up Catholic. It's Catholic people are in my mind and heart. I know people who are out the Jehovah Witnesses. Let me tell you something. I've sinned. Father, forgive me. I blah, 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 blah in the closet. Oh, go do this. What gives that man the right to tell me about sins and, and payment of sins? He's never done nothing for me. You putting your faith and trust in a human man that's a sinner. That's a sin. Add that one. Whatever sins you confess in that booth, let's say you said five sins. Add one more for going to that idiot. Add two for going to an idiot that doesn't know how to put his collar on. And then you put those beads in your hand and you start counting those beads. Did you forget thou shalt not have any idols? Thou shalt not bow down and pray to them? All right, for all the sins that you've had and the sins of going to that closet with that guy and professing him rather than God, now you got an idolatrous thing in your hand. Add that another sin to it. 
And then add the sin when you go to Mary to help you out. And the Bible says nothing about Mary. There's one me here between man and between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and another sin. We're in one afternoon in a church service, and you've added sins where you thought they're being taken away. That's religion. I could probably do that with other religions, but I don't know about other religions. I think you can take Paul for his word, after all. God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit entrusted him with the gospel. Paul's just not throwing, oh, just lay it on my charge. He's serious. And I think if I leave him said, uh, let's think of something right now. If I leave him said, I was going to beat the daylights out of him for leaving. I think Paul would have walked up to finally him. Here's the stick and do it. If he would have charged old Nasmus 500 talents, Paul would have walked up to five and said, 1, 2, 3, 495, 496, 497, 498, 499, 500 talents. Paul would have done that. Paul wouldn't have lied. I read Paul. When he had to work for his needs. I read that Paul was honest. In the scriptures. Not only Paul said it. But the people he traveled with. Luke said he was honest. So let's take this statement. About imputation. Paul is being honest. He's being sincere. He's being true. He is a type of Jesus Christ. Who can never lie to us. When was the last time you read Philemon? When was the last time you studied Philemon? When's the last time your church ever opened up the Philemon? Where did he ever blame or deny his going to Jerusalem? And he was warned three times. Don't go to Jerusalem. Now I will repay. He meant it. What a love he had for Onesimus, and what a love for Jesus Christ had for us. Father, Stali cannot pay for his sins. Let me go and take his place when he is judged, and you will judge me through him upon Calvary's cross. A lot better going to the great white throne judgment for me. It will be upon me, Father. All that he's done in sin. And if you don't look at Calvary. You don't look at the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And your your eyes don't start getting watery. There's something wrong. You need to go back to Bethel. You need to get on your knees at Bethel. And get right with God. So what does Paul mean? Always me. First, Paul doesn't bring it up, whatever the matter is. There are some people you borrow a dollar from or coins from a soda machine, and they will let you know that, hey, I gave you 75 cents for that soda the other day. Look what I've done for you. Bragging and boasting. Paul's not doing that, but he's, you know, if I leave him, you owe me some things. And Paul is an I told you so kind of guy. When that shipwreck, he tells him, listen, let us not go. I have spoke to God. There's going to, be a, there's going to be a storm. It's going to be, everything's going to be destroyed. And they go off. And later on, Paul walks out there. They're throwing everything overboard. And they're praying. And Luke's like, we're going to die. Paul steps on and says, I told you so. <laughs> but he's not doing it here with Philemon. He says, listen. Philemon, you owe me a debt. This is probably the first time it has come to Paul's lips through writing. Was it that Paul had witnessed to Philemon? Did Philemon have a debt owed to Paul? Thy own self. No one else or you personally. I don't know. I have the note in my Bible that you owe me your life. But Paul doesn't speak. Paul doesn't speak anything else. But Philemon, when it comes to Onassis, you put it on my account. But you better remember 
You owe me some things too. That's a bold statement. And he's taken maybe if Philemon doesn't agree, doesn't get right by old Nasmus. I mean, remember, we don't know how at this point, at this layer where you are right now, we don't know how Philemon's going to act. It could be for good or it could be worse. But salvation wrought by Jesus Christ is this very fact. It's a big word, imputation. My sins was placed upon the beating and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. I didn't suffer. I didn't do anything right by God. I did wrong. The right that I had done was putting my faith and trust in that finished work of Jesus Christ. And we're warned because there's other Gospels out there. And I've seen them. There's a Gospel of being baptized. There's a Gospel of speaking blah, 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 blah. There's a Gospel out there that mom is going to pray for my salvation. There's a Gospel out there that I'm in this church. I'm a Baptist Briner. This is the one universal church, and if you don't do, you're anathema. There's all kinds of salvations out there that is not approved of God, that Jesus Christ is not involved in. And the Bible tells us there's another Jesus. There's a Jesus who has not finished the work of God. There's a Jesus that is not God. There's a Jesus that... Hey, anything you do is okay. I'm happy, go lucky. I'm your homeboy. But when we get down and relate to what Jesus Christ has suffered and died and bled, again, when, for me, for me, if I were to die, I avoid hell. I am Absent from this body and present with the Lord. Why? Jesus Christ. That moment in the rapture happened while I'm living, I will be gone. Why? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, all my sins. I am saved by Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice that he suffered and died according to the scriptures and was buried and arose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is what saved my soul. When God has taken those sins and laid them upon Jesus and he has taken the righteousness and the holiness of Jesus and applied it to me. I've got righteousness, but Jesus Christ's righteousness. And that alone. 